I'm John Horn. Thanks for coming out, um, and thanks for sticking around. I'm going to bring out our actor, Glenn Howerton. It's okay. We can try it again. You want to make another entrance? We're going to try another take. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very well. Um, first of all, I'm a huge hockey fan, huge LA Kings fan. I won't spoil the game tonight, but they did set an NHL record. Um, do you know anything about hockey? Because your character is obsessed with hockey. You're watching Don Cherry videos on a plane. Oh, boy. Um, not really. <laughs> not really, no. <laughs> okay, so you didn't go into character research. It's a sport, uh, right? It is a sport. Um, they, and they have sticks, and then there's like a little thing that slides around. Yeah, it's yeah I know what it is. Okay, yeah, 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 of course. Because uh, um, Valsili tried to buy not one, not two, not three, but four NHL teams. Yeah, he kept at it. He kept at it. I think he did not learn... Um, you know, first time, shame on you, second time. Well, that's, you now you're giving away the sequel. That's oh, just that's him, him trying to buy hockey teams the entire movie. <laughs> it could work. Um, I know that the timing of your starting on this movie to filming was relatively brief. Is that a fair description? It, yeah, I mean, it was, I think in comparison to, you know, you hear about these actors that were like, I've been preparing for this for six months. And like, how wonderful for you. I got the script like, three and a half weeks before I was supposed to start shooting. So I, was, I didn't have that luxury. And why did you want to do it? Because I suspect you weren't familiar with the filmmakers before you signed on because they're very talented, but not high profile. Yeah, no, I actually did not know anything about uh, them prior to this, which is, a, which is a shame because they're tremendously talented. And um, I, I had the privilege of first watching, I, I watched The Dirties, that was the first thing I watched. I don't know if you guys have seen that movie, but it's it's phenomenal. Uh, and so I knew right off the bat that I was dealing with some pretty smart smart guys. And then, But I'd also read the script at that point, and the script was brilliant. I mean, it was really so beautifully crafted, one of the better scripts I've read in a very long time. Um, so I knew I was dealing with some smart people, um, and then I had a, a, a nice long Zoom conversation with Matt Johnson from Toronto, and uh, he was he had an answer for every single question, any, any specific line or even piece of stage direction that I had questions about. He had a very, very specific reason why it was in the script. And that, that, that's the most important thing for me, because I, I like to... I really want to feel like I can play and have fun and try a bunch of different mm -hmm. things when I'm on set to give the director a lot of options, but only if I trust that that director knows what he's doing or she's doing. If if they don't know what they're doing, then 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 ooh, that's scary. Then you then you feel like you have to craft the exact performance. You don't want to deviate from it at all. Right. But there's danger in that too because what if what your choices are aren't the best choices. No, I know, I know actors who say of working with first-time filmmakers, the actor's mistake is often imagining the best version of what that movie's going to be, but if you're careful, you have to imagine the worst version of that movie and make sure that's still something you want to be in. When you're working with filmmakers, you don't know, and we should also point out Matt plays Doug in this film, so you're yeah. opposite him in a fair number of scenes, being very mean to him. Yes, yelling at him. Yelling at him, Frequently. and he is your director, so you get to vent that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was fun to yell at. You know what I mean? In character. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so three and a half weeks means you can do what, I mean, there are actors like Anthony Hopkins will just like, the script is my Bible. And I can think about other things, but if it's not on the page, I don't need to go there. Meaning too much knowledge is a dangerous thing. Interesting and, that you brought that up. Oh, go ahead. Okay. And then there's people who like to you know, Daniel Day-Lewis, and actually cobble shoes for a couple of years. So you don't have the time to learn how to cobble shoes or whatever Daniel Day-Lewis is doing. Or the desire. Okay, but Anthony <laughs> Hopkins, the mod, that model, is that more akin to how you like to work? It is, actually. I, I was going to say, it's interesting that you brought up Anthony Hopkins because that was exactly the first person that I thought of when I was, when I was preparing for this. Uh, I knew that that was his thing. And I, coming from... Um, my background, it, it's, it, it makes sense to me that it, especially when you know, like I did, that the writers of the script, Matt Johnson and Matt Miller, 
had done such a tremendous amount of research. Not only were they basing it on the book, in which Jim and, and all the characters in it were interviewed and spoken to, but they also spoke to people that worked at the company. So they did a lot of research well outside of the confines of the book. And uh, you know, they knew the material very, very well. And they, I felt like they were representing the world mm -hmm. very accurately. Um, so, and again, knowing that I only had three and a half weeks to prepare for this, um, I did pretty much stick to the Anthony Hopkins method. Um, I did, I did a, a certain amount of research outside of it, but I really focused mostly on on the script itself. I mean, Jim is himself somewhat private. I don't think there's a lot of video of him doing TED talks or things like that. Um, so you have a limited access. You have limited access to him out in public. So how do you come up with? a way that he carries himself. Where's the, I mean, we obviously have hair and makeup, but where do you, where did you find his inner life based on how little you knew about how he looked outwardly? I mean, it's gonna sound kind of corny, but I really did latch on to the lines in the script about Jim being a bit of a shark. Um, and so I found myself almost, I, again, kind of leading with my head mm -hmm. a little bit and mm -hmm. my chest almost like there was this there was this overall feeling of constantly needing to move and be on the hunt and looking for the next thing there was actually a line in the in the movie it got cut from the movie and then they, they is it in the miniseries it is actually Do you guys know about this it is not just a movie it's a miniseries we'll come back to that in a second but <laughs> yeah so they put it they they he put it back in uh for the limited series um but it's a moment between him and, and Gary at the NHL where they, the so in the movie that first conversation that they have they don't even we don't even show that conversation right. in the limited we show the conversation okay. and, and he Gary is Gary Bettman the yeah, commissioner sorry, Gary of Bettman. NHL and uh, he said Gary says to Jim he says it's it's looking very good this is this is looking very promising and and I have this moment where it's like okay this very brief moment of that's a win and then my next line is okay what's next. So like right right on the heels of getting this wonderful news that that my all of my dreams all of my hockey right. dreams are going to come true, my first thought is what's next, and that actually wasn't in the script. That was something that that Matt and I in our many conversations came up with that because we felt like that was kind of the the heart and soul and essence of Jim, in a nutshell. It was like okay, great, we did that. What next? What's next? What's next? What you know? When where's my next meal? He mortgaged his house yeah. to invest in this company. And it's kind of unsaid, but I'm sure you and Matt have an understanding. What was it that he saw in this? Was it an opportunity or the idea? Because one is just widgets. The other one is we're doing something that's transformative. How much did he believe in the product or did he just believe in the numbers? I, I think he saw um, a product that, mm -hmm. that he could sell. He his he's a salesman. That's what he is. Um, I don't think he really cares about technology that much. I don't even think he cared about the phone or, or any of that. But I did think that I do think that he wanted to be the boss. He wanted to run something. He wanted to be the head of something. He wanted to be, you know, the big man in the room. And he saw an opportunity because he saw these two goofballs with a great idea but no presence in a room, and he knew that he could essentially take over. We were talking just before we came in about Alexander Payne and his and his new movie Holdovers. Alexander cast in a key part as as the kind of cook at the school, somebody who was best known for comedy. And the reason he did so is because he felt if you put, you know, too serious an actor in a serious part, it becomes so somber that there's something that comedians bring to a serious part that serious actors don't quite understand. Now, while this isn't a comedy, Jim is a Comic character, what would you say? Uh, there's comedy in it, yeah. I mean, it's just built into sort of the ridiculousness of some of some of the behavior, and I think also the just the dy the na the dynamic between someone like Jim and two characters like Mike and Doug. There's inherent comedy in that, just because they they they, they can't understand each other. They come from completely different worlds and different viewpoints, and so there's just inherent sort of you know uh, comedy in that. Yeah. When you were reading the script, you said you had questions for Matt. At what point, when you're reading a script, for any script, 
do you start to think about doing it? And is it seeing yourself visually in the role? Is it imagining what that dialogue sounds coming out of your mouth? How is your creative process when you're reading a script about seeing yourself doing that movie, and does it happen gradually, or do you kind of lock in at a certain point? So I, I, I've, I've studied a lot of acting, and I, was, I went to school for acting for six years. Uh, rhymes with Juilliard. And uh, what's that? Rhymes with Juilliard. It does rhyme with Juilliard. <laughs> so much so that it, that it is. Um, but, but then on top of that, so I, I, I love the craft of acting. And I, and I love reading acting books. I read acting books just for fun. But the funny thing is, is I don't follow the advice of any of them. And I, it's because I, I don't know, but like there's this thing, there's this running theme in a lot of the training, which is don't judge the material, right? Read the material, try to remain neutral, right? right? Try to take in all the information and, and, and then slowly formulate your ideas after reading it numerous times and doing your research and all this stuff. And I just find that that's, well, I, for me, that's bullshit. Rhymes with bullshit. It rhymes with bullshit. <laughs> it just doesn't work. I, for me, again, right, <laughs> other people are different and I know that there are people that, that work that way. I read something, I have an immediate gut response to the material. Mm -hmm. And that becomes actually, the, and that's exactly what they say. Don't, all the acting books say, don't do, don't trust that because that's wrong. You don't know anything yet. And I'm like, <laughs> I kind of feel like I do. I kind of feel like I do. And, it, and, it, and even though it evolves and it changes, it never stays the same. That does become a bit of, um, I don't know, a Rosetta Stone right. for me. My, I think my initial response to the material may be similar to the audience's initial response to the material. And so I don't think it's wrong. I think, right. I think. You should trust that gut experience, that that gut feeling as an artist. I mean, it's a little bit like if you're a musician playing jazz and you stepped on stage and you heard people playing and you just kind of picked up your instrument and started playing along. Nobody's going to go, well, no, wait a minute, <laughs> study this, yeah. study this performance uh, over right. and over and over again before you feel so confident as to play it. That's sure, that's a one way to do it, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a gut response. So to answer your question, also yeah. though, is I, I hear it first right. and I, I. I feel it in my gut. And I know it's right when I, because I start saying the lines out loud. I can't and there's it. so many great lines early in the movie. Uh, we'll get to Waterloo, that's where vampires hang out. But, you know, uh, get these fucking nerds to drop everything and build this fucking phone to the cabbie. We gotta move here, man, my wife's in labor. Um, yeah. Are there, is it an accumulation of lines or do you start, I mean, are there certain lines you lock into where it's like that line, I mean, those lines kind of speak for the character. I mean, the line to the cabbie, you know who he is based on what he says. Right, right, which is just good writing. Right, uh, That's just tremendously good writing. Um, yeah, I, it, it's very musical for me, um, uh, often. Um, and, and that could be a trap, too, because I can, I can lock into a certain musicality and I can't get away from it. Right. Um, and that, that, that sometimes can, can be a hindrance. But, uh, but yeah, certainly, there are, there are lines that I, I hear it in my... I hear the script in my head like a piece of music. Mm -hmm. that, that's how it comes, that's how it is for me. There are not a lot of similarities in character between what you play in this movie and It's Always Sunny, but there are some similarities that I thought about, and that is making a show like It's Always Sunny is basically what Jim is doing with Blackberry. They're pushing, you know, they're pushing the rock up the hill. They're not taking no for an answer. Everybody's saying, this is madness, don't do it. And I wonder if you ever thought about that consciously, that what you did in getting Sonny going and what this character is doing in getting Blackberry going are in some ways parallel tracks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. That was one of the major things that I was able to relate to as far as Jim goes. And even though my personality is very, very different from Jim's in real life, uh, the three of us as a unit, me and uh, Rob McElhenney and Charlie Day, who created It's Always Sunny, um, we did run up against a lot of obstacles in those early days. We had a lot of allies, too. We had a lot of people who really believed in what we were doing, and almost everybody that we were working with believed in it. But there were a lot of people who were saying, right, but you can't, you know, trying to push us and say, you can't, especially the early directors that we were working with, um, some of whom uh, were trying to push us in a direction that we felt like was a little too conventional, or but it's like, we're not, we don't want to do it that way because we've seen that. We're trying right. to do something different. You know, there was a lot of resistance about us 
all talking over each other, right. which our characters... We can't hear you. Separate yeah. your dialogue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a lot of our editors has been like, I, I don't know how to edit this together. You're all talking at the same time. And we're like, like, well, that's, that's how people talk. talk. That's how people talk. But that's also right. why we have multiple cameras going so that you can ideally maybe cut between one take, especially when the dialogue is all overlapped like that. And it makes it feel, it gives it a feeling of, of improvisational and, and makes it feel real in a cool way. Jim in this film is somebody who speaks his mind and speaks it succinctly. And then he doesn't have words. And there are some moments where he is silent. And I think when you set up the character as somebody who is always to the point, he's terse, he's gonna say what's on his mind, when he doesn't have the words for what he's feeling, it really exposes him. There are two or three moments toward the end of the film um, at the airport and then when he's talking with Jay's character about not having the words to get him out. And I wonder what those scenes were like in filming because it's clearly a counterpoint to how this character has behaved through most of the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most, some of the most interesting moments, uh, some of the moments that I enjoy most in other actors' performances are the moments between lines where you can see them thinking. Um, and if you're doing, if I'm doing my job correctly, um, I am advocating for the character's want, right? Like, mm -hmm. if I'm in a scene with someone, I, I, I need something desperately from that person. Because if I don't, then where's the inherent drama in that scene? I need to get something from that person. So when I'm talking, I'm actively trying to get it from right. them. And when I'm not talking, I'm looking to see if I'm getting it. You know what I mean? And are you gonna give me what I want? And if you're not gonna give me what I want, I gotta think about how I'm gonna switch tactics and, get, and, and try something different. So those moments are, are often moments of having to just switch gears. You know, it's like you, 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 you're trying a thing, it's not working, you're hit with a bunch of new information, you have to process that information. So some of it is, is really just watching a lot of really great performances and realizing that some of them, it's really just, you're just watching the actor really think the thoughts right. and then trusting that it'll hopefully show up on your, on your face too. <laughs> you said you had questions when you read the script for Matt. When you're on set, are the questions radically different or are they iterations of the questions that you had in your first conversations with him? A little bit of both. Um, sometimes new questions come up when, when you're in the scene, you're in the moment, that things that you can't uh, anticipate come up and you've got questions then. But often they are variations of questions that you've been grappling with the entire time. You don't realize until, you know, hopefully by that point too, maybe you've shot four or five scenes already so you've got a little bit of a better idea of where, where the movie's headed, uh, what, what the tone is um, and all that. But, uh, but there's always gonna be those clarification questions as you go. What about working with Jay? Because Jay is a very funny actor. Um, he's also a very gifted actor. How do you find your rhythms and, or with Matt, because you have different personalities as actors, and I'm wondering how you find a common ground where everybody is getting what they want and Matt's getting what he needs. Well, I mean, I guess in some ways I just, I, I relinquish that control, which is nice on this, I can right. do that. On Sunny, I, I can't, I can't <laughs> relinquish that control. I have to be thinking as an act, as, I have to be giving a performance as an actor, but then I also have to be, on some level, kind of thinking about the whole thing. Um, although we do, you know, we have a director and we have a brain trust of people that are all doing that, but I, I can't ever let fully let that go when, it, when it's my show. But, um, but on this, I, I, I was just trusting that if it wasn't what, and I also learned very early that if Matt wasn't getting what he wanted, he was gonna, he was gonna keep trying stuff. Correct. So I knew that we were never gonna leave a scene and it wasn't finished, it wasn't quite, he never got it. We never, there were scenes that went on interminably long because he wasn't getting what he wanted. From his actors or from himself? Because that's a, that's a mistake many directors make if they're acting in the movie, they don't shoot enough of themselves because it feels greedy and then they get in the uh, editing room and they don't have it. Oh, interesting. No, he was pretty good about that. I mean, okay. he, he definitely wasn't one of those people to spend a lot of time on his on his character. I think, if anything, he probably did err towards right. not spending enough time on his on his character. Um, but uh, you know, he he was pretty greedy about asking us for more and more okay. and more and more and more. And he really they they carved out that schedule in a way where they could really focus on the performances. So 
you know, the, there weren't a ton of complicated setups. It was usually like one or two setups that were maybe a little complicated and then mm -hmm. move on. So we really had a lot of time to play within within that framework because we didn't have to get through 500 setups, you know. The amazing thing about the character, the person you play, since leaving BlackBerry in 2012, uh, Vasily has taken up a number of roles in Canadian business and society. He's the founder of the Vasily School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo. This one's kind of funny. The Center for International Governance and Innovation. It's a think tank and serves as the chair of the Canadian Council of Innovators. Did you have any contact with him after you finished the movie? Did he see it and say, close enough? Or what were your conversations? Close enough, pal. I mean that's high praise. Yeah. I think from some. I don't. I don't mean that as a criticism. No, no, no. That would be a that would be high praise when you're no, playing I, somebody like this. It would have been hilarious if that's all he said to me when I met him. Um, I did. I did meet him uh, at the Toronto premiere. Uh, we had a Canadian premiere. We had to, of course. That makes sense. Um, and he came. He had seen. Uh, they sent him a link to the movie or a screener or something. So he had seen it. And 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 I think. Even though he didn't say, he was very gracious about it. He did an interview afterwards. He was like, well, I think I was a little bit funnier than that. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, I think when he was watching it by himself, he saw maybe he was only able to see my, his, himself as being portrayed as the villain of the movie. But then when, the, when he saw it with an audience at the Toronto premiere, um, I think he was able to see that people were actually rooting for him, that, that he was eh, an antagonistic protagonist, but a protagonist nonetheless. And, and a, and a, a strong uh, look. I think you watch the movie and you go, "Wow, he can be a tyrannical asshole, but somebody's got to do it." You know, someone's kind of got to do it. Maybe, maybe you could do it slightly differently, but it's also kind of fun to watch somebody right. tear through the world. You know, uh, uh, re refusing to take no for an answer. In 2021, a senior engineer at REM, BlackBerry, sent a letter that was leaked and published to Michael and Jim. I just want to read from it because I think it shows how, how right you were on what was happening inside the culture. It says, almost every project is falling further and further behind schedule at a time when we absolutely must deliver great, solid products on time. Rather than constantly mocking iPhone and Android, we should encourage key decision makers across the board to use these products as their primary device for a week or so at a time. Yes, on exchange. That way we can understand why our users are switching and get inspiration as to how we can build our next gen products. It's incomprehensible that our top software engineers and executives aren't using or deeply familiar with their competitors' products Teams still aren't talking together properly. No one is making or can make critical decisions. All the while, everyone is working crazy hours and still far behind. We are, I didn't know this word existed, demotivated. And finally, there's a serious need to consolidate our focus to just a handful of projects, period. We need to be disciplined here. So I think the movie really captures that spirit of what was working and what wasn't. I want to ask you one last thing. You had a Gotham nomination, a Spirit Award nomination. How do you think that might help bring attention to this film? Because it's really good work and it's a really good movie. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think that it inherently does. I mean, if people are talking about the movie, if, if the press is talking about the movie, whether it's my performance or Jay's performance or the movie itself or whatever, I mean, that that's a wonderful thing. I, I, I feel like we made something good here and, and I just want people to watch it. Um, you know, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, it doesn't need to be about me, uh, certainly. Um, I'm not used to that, actually. It's quite uh, strange to me. I'm, I'm used to being part of an ensemble. I'm used to being up on, you know, having these Q&As with like <laughs> three or four <laughs> other people with me. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit accustomed to it because I've now been doing this for a little while with this movie, but uh, it's all very strange to me. But but I, I, I'm very excited that people are, are watching this film. I mean, I think you can make a great movie, but you, you never know if people are going to ever, ever actually see it or if it's really going to get talked about. Or you know, And this is one of those rare instances in which I feel like we made a good movie and people are talking about it. And it, and it, and it has got great word of mouth. And, and I think that that has been the, the main driver of success for this film has been word of mouth. Last question for the audience. How many people had a BlackBerry at one point? And how many people 
kept using them way too long when we should have gotten rid of them. <laughs> okay, my hand is way up. I want to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you, guys. And, uh, we're all outside for our great reception. The cheese and liquor, wine, whatever is out there is out there. Cheese and booze. Perfect combo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.